Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Forgot to clean my glasses, but time we get started anyway. Um, today we're going to be talking about for pastors to become brutish. Uh, before we get into the study, a prayer request. I'm going to go in at the end of the month for eye exam again. It seems like maybe I need new glasses. So I remember back in the past, I have that was on my prayer request a lot that God will watch over my. Um, eyes and healed eyes. I had a sister in Christ that recommended certain teas and herbal re remedies to help with the eyes. Um, so just throw that out there as a prayer request that God will slow the deterioration of my eyes and you know help me if I need new glasses we'll get new glasses. So sorry about that. So Make sure you have your King James Bibles open. King James Bibles. Right? All other Bibles come from the Vatican. I've got books over there. We might do videos again showing that why I'm a King James Bible believer. Because this is God's perfect written word. This is the only book on this earth in English that has the true plan of salvation. All the other Bible perversions that are Catholic Bibles pervert the gospel. And I was talking with the Lord about this a little side note, and it's like, why is it that you have people that use NIVs, but they preach the gospel that's out of here, not their NIV? Why do you have people with the New American Standard that preach the gospel out of here? Not all of them, but some preach the gospel out of here, and not out of the book that they have professes the word of God. Well, what I believe is, brothers and Christ, is a lot of the ba the battle buildings back when they were. Still battle buildings, but they were church buildings that they were based off of this. So they're preaching the gospel because they have the King James Bible. And over time, they've replaced their King James Bibles with new King James Bibles. And they, still, and they kept preaching the same gospel that they got from here, even though they're using the new King James Bible that doesn't have that same gospel. They take repentance out. And then they go from the new King James and replace all those with NIVs or New American Standards. And over time, because it's all about traditions of men, the gospel they preach becomes a traditions of men. Not They don't have the foundation anymore of where that gospel came from. Right. So how does a true plan of salvation get out and people are using Bible perversions? Because sometimes those Bible buildings will still keep preaching the same gospel that came from here, but you won't find it in the book that they're using. Why? Because... They've learned not to go off the book they're using. They just go off of traditions of men. Men's words. Men's wisdom. Right? So, just a little side note. Make sure you get your King James Bible out. God's perfect written word for English-speaking people. Okay. Go ahead and turn to Jeremiah 10.18. Some of us are like, that's ah, a little bit slower for us because we don't know exactly <laughs> the Old Testament. Exactly in order. But Jeremiah chapter 10. We're going to go over something here. And before we hit Jeremiah chapter 10, I'm always going to read this lately. Not always, but the Lord's put on my heart to read these verses lately because brethren have forgotten this. They read the Bible and it's just about feelings and opinions and you get people arguing and fighting over things that aren't worth fighting over. What we're going to be talking about today is serious and it's important. But you've got to understand, 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture which we're reading the Bible says things that are written before time are written for our learning I've had brethren out there that they'll take stuff from the Old Testament that condemns what they're doing and it lines up with the New Testament that condemns what they're doing and they when you grab from the Old Testament for our learning they'll say it's written to the Jews it's not written to us and they're right but what they leave out is is it's written for our learning we can learn from the mistakes that they made in the Old Testament that we don't make the same mistakes. Instruction and righteousness. Okay? There's a lot of things we can learn from their mistakes. And there's a lot of things we can learn from them doing what's right and being faithful and having courage. That's why we got that series of studies, Courageous Man or Foolish Man, going throughout the whole Bible, Old Testament to New Testament. Courageous Man, Foolish Man. What can we learn from this? How to be courageous and do what's right in God's eyes. 
Okay, but all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, so he will be furnished with all good, unto all good works. Remember the heart. If you want to have a perfect heart before the Lord, you have to have this in it. Why? Because this is perfect. This is not perfect. This is perfect. If the world is definitely not perfect. If you're hiding the world in your heart, you're not going to be perfect before God. But if you're hiding God's Word in your heart and living it, you can be perfect before God because His Word is perfect. You're still This body of flesh is still going to make mistakes, but when it's talking about perfect, it's talking about the perfect heart. We talked about this. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in. And through the Holy Spirit, you have Jesus in you, and Jesus is a light to the world through you. Is Jesus perfect? Is He in your heart? Is His Word in your heart? Those two things are perfect. That's what it's talking about when it says the God, man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Furnished. In other words, you're without excuse. Once God shows you what good works are, you're without excuse. He's furnished you with a book. Today. We're talking about today. Well, where did it come from in the past? I'm worried about today. Where's God's perfect written word today? Right here, the King James Bible. He's furnished us with it. So we can live it. We're without excuse. Furnished unto all good works. Not guaranteed that we're going to do all good works. Because I have made mistakes. I have failed the Lord numerous times in my walk. I have failed the brethren numerous times in my walk. Right? It says furnished. But I'm without excuse. Okay? There's times where I might be ignorant. And, and, and God's like, you know... When someone's ignorant, he doesn't hold you accountable, but he won't leave you ignorant. He'll preach the truth to you. And you have men out there that the Bible says, if a man be ignorant, let him be ignorant still. In other words, when you preach the truth to them or point at them in the direction where they can find truth, and they don't want to find truth, let them be ignorant. God, now they're accountable, and they can act ignorant all they want. God will hold them accountable. We're supposed to study. I see, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. King James Bible. Remember, it's God's Word and it's God's wisdom that we want. We don't want man's words and we don't want man's wisdom. God can sometimes show us things through brethren. I've learned a lot from other brethren. Okay? Through the Scriptures. But when it comes to the wisdom of this world, which is apart from the Scriptures, and men's words that's apart from the Scriptures are trying to pervert the Scriptures, I'll stick with the Scriptures. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I forgot what the other one was, but there was two verses that I used there for a while that um, were hardcore when it comes to the Bible perversions. This is one of them. 2 Timothy 2.15 that I go through and I check, because sometimes it won't say, if you go to a used bookstore, you might find an old enough Bible that it won't say, Authorized King James. It'll just say, Holy Bible. And you open it up and it says authorized version. Holy Bible. And you're like, well, I don't know what kind, what, what version is it? Okay, because that can be deceptive because you have a lot of the Bible versions try to copy this book and they'll say authorized version. They'll say Holy Bible. Okay? But one of the verses I'd look is that one because the word study has been taken out of all the Bible perversions. I don't know about the most recent, recent ones, but... Most of the Bible, all the Bible versions, when I got saved eight years ago, all the Bible perversions had taken out the word study. And there's some other verses you go off of that they've taken stuff out completely in all the Bible versions. Except for the one true Word of God, the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. You want to be approved unto God like we're going to be talking about today for pastors that become brutish? You want to be approved unto God, brothers and sisters in Christ? You need to study to show thyself approved. This study that we're going to be talking about is mainly going to be directed at men in ministry or men that want to be in ministry. Okay? Study to show thyself approved unto God. You want your ministry to be approved unto God? It better line up with the Scriptures. When it starts going the way of the world, like you see almost every Babel building has gone the way of the world, we see brethren... Mainly, there are a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing online that they're the way of the world. They're brutish pastors. And you can even see brethren falling away and becoming brutish online. 
That's the way the world's going. The Bible talks about the falling away happens, and then that man of sin is, it says, and that man of sin, I don't want to add to the scriptures, and that man of sin be revealed. It almost happens like you get to a point where the body of Christ really falls away, and boom, we get caught up, and then that man of sin is revealed. We're at that last part where no matter how much preaching I do and how much love I show, I got brethren that I love and care about that are acting like my mortal enemies. We're in the last days. And it breaks my heart. But it says the study shall itself approved. Your ministry is supposed to be approved by the scriptures and by brethren who stand by the scriptures. Right. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now understand, what we read here in Jeremiah 10, it's written to the Jewish people. But it's written for our learning, so we don't make the same mistakes. And as you see, as we get through this, we're going to be jumping all over the Bible to the New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament. Okay? It's for our learning. We don't make the same mistakes that they made in the past. We, stay, we have courage I mean, how many have courage when you read about King David, uh, Solomon, uh, Samuel, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the mistakes they made and the times that they stood firm to the Lord and did what was right? How many times have you read stories in the Old Testament that gave you courage? That man loved the Lord. David, King David was a man after God's own heart. Do you want to be a man after God's own heart? You, then you get to the still Old Testament Going into the New Testament, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Remember what Jesus said, if you don't hate mother, father, wife, children, yea, even your cell own life, you can't be my disciple. You want to be a disciple whom Jesus loved? You've got to give him your all. He comes first, period, before anything in this world and anyone in this world. Him and his word, they go hand in hand. Do you want to be like John was, a disciple whom Jesus loved? We get courage from these things. So we're going to start this off in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 18. 10, verse 18. I like to read from my notes because I highlight things or underline things that I want to talk about. But I'm going to try to turn all the time. It's going to be a long study. I'm probably going to break it down into multiple parts. But I want to go through with you and turn with you. Right? But Jeremiah 10, 18, plus this is larger writing than this. <laughs> Jeremiah 10, 18. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once, and will distress them, that they may find it so. Woe is to me for the hurt. My wound is grievous. But I said, Truly this is a grief, and I must bear it. My tabernacle is spoiled, and all my cords are broken. My children have gone forth of me, and they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent any more and to set up my curtains. Now today, our body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. But how do you think God feels when you have a brother or sister in Christ today that gets saved, they start filling their heart with the Word of God, and they're living a life of Christ, and they start going back to the ways of the world. I'm getting ahead of myself, but the three enemies, the world, the flesh, Satan, the two biggest things about Satan is pride, and lying, being a hater of the truth, being a hater of the truth, attacking the truth. How do you think he feels when he sees a brother or sister, a child, a son of God, child of God, that starts going back to the way of the world and perverting this temple? Something to think about. But here's the key verse that we're going to be going off of, verse 21. For the pastors are become brutish. These are men that are, that are like leaders that are supposed to be pointing people to truth and the right way. God's way. Doing things God's way. Doing things that please God and encouraging the brethren through His Word. To love God. What did Jesus say? If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. True love for God, true love for Jesus Christ who is God, fully and completely, is you do the best to keep his word. Jesus said, you are my friends, if you do whatsoever I, uh, I command you. You mean to be a friend of Jesus means you do what he commands you? Yeah. For pastors are become brutish. 
and have not sought the Lord. What happens when you become brutish? You have not sought the Lord. What happens then? You become brutish. It starts messing you up. And we just read before that how the people are falling apart. And we're going to get to that. But you become brutish. You stop looking at seeking the Lord. Therefore shall you not prosper. And we're going to get into this. They're, they always try to say, well, I must be prospering. Look at me. I must be prosper prospering physically. Sometimes this is talking physically. But oftentimes when it comes to fruit, spiritual fruit, it's about the brethren. If you're a pastor, a preacher, a teacher in ministry, the fruit, the true prospering, is the brethren. Are you affecting brethren's lives by getting them to look for Jesus Christ every day with His coming? With the life that they're living? Is there fruit among the brethren based off of you pointing them to the Word of God? And to love God? And to keep their eyes on God? That's the prosperity that matters. But you have some people that get in ministries in these Babel buildings and some online that they start pointing out all this physical stuff, this wealth that they have, and they think that's why it makes, that's the prospering part. So this says, shall not prosper, look at me. It's not talking about me because I'm prospering. But you look at the fruit of the ministry, the rotten fruit. Is it good fruit or is it rotten fruit? Or is there zero fruit? That's the three things you look for. Good fruit, rotten fruit, zero fruit. Rotten or bad fruit, zero fruit. If it's all rotten fruit, bad fruit, and zero fruit, they're not prospering. And what does the Bible say? When a pastor becomes brutish and he stops seeking the Lord, he shall not prosper. And all their flock shall be scattered. Why does their flock get scattered? Remember what I told you, the most dangerous Christian today is Christians that fall into the trap of respecter of persons. They start idolizing and following just one man, and they start idolizing that man, and that man becomes a lowercase g God to them. And it doesn't matter what that man does at that point, they'll might, they might say, well, he shouldn't have done that. And yeah, they start making excuses for him. They try to justify what he does. And they follow that man. But what happens when that man gets destroyed? The flock shall be scattered. Why? Because they were followers of that man. Now don't get me wrong, good pastors, good shepherds are supposed to guide the flock. And if you don't have a good shepherd, the flock's just going to scatter, period. I understand that. But what's going on here is the pastor's become brutish. Something happens to the pastor. He's a good pastor, he's a good shepherd, and something happens. And everything starts falling apart. We'll get back to this. Remember that verse, because we're going to get back to it. Verse 22. Behold, the noise of the brood has come. When, when pastors get brutish, it all becomes about, and we're going to get this, it's all going to become about me, myself, and I. They get really loud. You can hear them coming a mile away. It's like you're sitting there on a park bench, and you look over, oh, there's Philip. I'm not a pastor. I'm just someone who preaches. I don't have a flock. I don't have a house church. I don't want to go off too much, but we might get to the studies in this Brothers of Christ where there's men online that kind of claim they're elders, and they're not. An elder is an ordained position by the church. Just because you're an old man doesn't make you an elder. Just because you've been saved 20 or 30 years doesn't make you an elder. An elder is an actual position in the church, and you're supposed to have those who are least esteemed as elders. Okay? Same thing with the bishop. The, the elders lay hands on a man and say, okay, we're praying for you. We're, this man is a man of God. He's gone through some training or loves the Word of God. You know, That's how you become a bishop. And it's over a physical flock. This online garbage, Satan's tool of online garbage, is really destroying how we do things God's way. So when a man online says, I'm an elder, and they're just an online minister like me, I'm not an elder. I'm just someone who loves the Lord and is trying to share God's word with you and trying to encourage the brethren to hide God's word in your heart every day and to live it. Don't be part of this falling away that's going on and it's getting more, greater and greater. Even men that we love and thought would never fall away, there's men out there falling away. Men, brothers and sisters in Christ. 
I'm not an elder because I haven't been ordained an elder by the church. I don't have a flock here. This is talking about having a flock. Okay? I don't have a flock. I'm not a bishop. Why? Because I, once again, it's an office of a bishop. I try to qualify for these things, and there's times in my life where I didn't qualify to be an elder, and I didn't qualify to be a bishop or a deacon, but I do my best to try to qualify present tense. I don't worry about the past, I worry about today. Present tense, do I qualify for these things in case God ever calls me to do a house church or be part of a house church? And same thing with the deacon. But there's men online that will try to claim I'm a bishop and you got to treat me like one. Or I'm an elder and you got to treat me like one. No, you are not. I'm not. If I had a house church here, then maybe an elder. Then maybe a bishop. Maybe. Depending on the circumstances God has set up, whatever house church is here. But that's required to have a house church. Your flock is not the whole world of God. I mean the whole world of God. The whole world that God has created. Okay, that's why Timothy, I'm getting off on a tangent, but uh, Timothy was sent places. Silas was sent places. When they went there, they were in the office of a bishop. When they came back to Paul, they were no longer in the office of a bishop. They were doing street witnessing ministry. Okay, there's a difference. Be careful about that. But you got these pastors, especially these Babel buildings, that will come... And they're very noisy. You can hear them coming a mile away. So if you're sitting there on a bench and you look over, and, oh, Brother Philip, I didn't even know you were there. Oh, hey, how's it going? And then you have those guys that you're sitting there on the bench, and you can hear them coming from the gate. And they're talking, oh, hey, 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 come on, you gotta, I got to get praise from men. Come on, come on, praise. I got to shake everybody's hand. I got to sign everybody's shirt and books and stuff. And I got to do this, and I got to And it says, behold, the noise of the brute is come. Good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple, because they are not seeking the Lord. Well, what's most popular today? What can I do to make to please the crowd? Remember um, Pontius Pilate, worried about pleasing the crowd. Um, remember about uh, Saul, was worried about pleasing the King Saul, was worried about pleasing the crowd. And get in worship of men. Behold, the noise of the brood has come. And a great commotion, commotion out of the north country to make the city of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. Ezekiel 8.3. Hold your finger there because we're going to keep going through Jeremiah 10 for a little bit. But hold your finger there and Ezekiel 8.3. What's this thing about commotion out of the north? Remember I told you what one of the enemies are? It's Satan. You got your, uh, the world. Doing things the world's way, and the world pushing you and pressuring you to do things its way. And you've got your flesh, trying to get you to do things that please the flesh, and not please God, and it's pressuring you. And then you've got Satan coming in and pressuring you, trying to fill you with pride, and get you to have a hate of the truth, and become a, a, a liar or a habitual liar. Okay? But Satan's one of the enemies, and it talks about great commotion in the north country. Hmm. Ezekiel 8.3. Ezekiel 3 And he put forth the form of an hand, and took me by the lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in a vision of God to Jerusalem, to the door at the inner gate that looketh towards the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. We serve a jealous God. Who's the number one creation that God created that wants to be him and replace him? He's like, there's only one God, God the Father. Only one God. If you don't believe Jesus is God the Father, then you don't believe in the one God. There's only one capital G God, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, God the Father. And he's a jealous God. And he says that you will, you will not worship idols, no matter what your justification is. It's just, it's just a hell of a day. I mean, hell, whatever your justification is, you will not worship idols. Covetousness can become an idol. When you covet something and start loving it more than you love the Word of God, and, Lord, and the Lord doesn't come first, that item comes first, 
that becomes an idol. Our God is a jealous God. Our God is also a consuming fire. There's no one person that's always trying to provoke God to jealousy. Satan. And he tries to get you, like the brother in the world, you, to provoke God to jealousy. That's what he's doing here to the Jewish people. He's getting the Jewish people to provoke God to jealousy by turning from God and his word to idols and the world. The words of men. North. It says there, commotion came out of the north country. When you have a pastor that becomes brutish, go ahead and turn back to Jeremiah 10. When you have a pastor that's becoming brutish, who are they truly serving? Who are they truly serving? The world, their flesh, and Satan. And you can have a man of God that does great at first, but like the Bible talks about the falling away, and over time. But mostly we're going to see this a lot in wolves in sheep's clothing, and uh, these Babel buildings, these false converts that's up there, these hirelings, they're brutish pastors. Now this says, are become brutish. In other words, if you become brutish, that means at one time you weren't brutish. You were a pastor that was standing. So for anything, like I said, this is mainly for brethren who want to get in ministry and who are already in ministry. And it starts with warning this man right here, don't become brutish. We're going to get into that. But I want to read the whole context of Jeremiah 10, and then we'll get into the brutish pastor. Okay. Jeremiah 10, 23, where we left off. Remember, three enemies. They're always... These three enemies will try to prevent someone from getting saved. Remember, if someone doesn't get saved, in the end, it's their fault. 100%. But they motivate. I'll use it this way. There's three things that motivate people not to get saved. The world, the flesh, and Satan. And there's three things that after you get saved that motivate you to try to destroy you so you're not no use to God at all. The world, the flesh, and Satan. All right. Jeremiah 10, 23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. But Satan comes along and says the opposite. The way of man is in himself. Look at the world. They come around and say it is of himself. It's, you can have it your way. You can get saved and live life your way. Yeah, I, I just had someone make a comment recently. I, I, I kind of agree with this salvation message, but I, um, I just don't believe in the changed life. Where does it say we're supposed to have a changed life? Well, here's another verse that talks about it, that when you serve God and you are following God, He's the one that's going to be directing your steps. He's the one that's going to be telling you, do this, don't do that, and you're going to listen to Him. But the world's way, when you're lost, is always going to be contrary to God's way. And when you get saved, there's going to be a changed life. O oh Lord, I know that thy way of that the way of man is not in himself, is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. What about Proverbs 16:9? Hold your finger there and go to Proverbs 16:9. Proverbs 16, 9. I have it highlighted, too. Proverbs, thank you, Lord. Highlighting's great. I've got another book that I'm doing hardcore highlighting in. It's always a good thing to highlight things and make notes. Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directs his steps. There's a difference. Your actions are what the Lord defines. This is what I want for you. This is how you're supposed to live. Do this. Don't do that. Cling to these things that are good. Stay away from those evil, wicked things. The Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. All appearance of evil. Okay? There's a changed life. And here it talks about is these preachers that have become brutish. They're not following the Lord's direction. They're following their flesh. Their flesh are telling them what to do. The world's telling them what to do. 
They might be even listening, to, like falling into the trap of whispering, hearing whispering what Satan's telling them to do. Puffing up their pride. Puffing up their ego. Getting them to have a problem with the truth. Getting them to start despising the truth. How many of those uh, Babel-building preachers have turned their back on the Word of God and gone to Bible perversions? They start hating the truth and attacking the truth for lies. Hmm. But a man's heart deviseth his way. There's times where we think this is the right way. This is the right way. I think this is the right way. And God's like, no. Something as simple as, uh, Lord, I, like right now, Lord, I want to start a house church. And God's like, you need to be patient. I don't know why, but God has his reasons. You need to be patient. You have brethren out there, they want to do this, they want to do that. And God's like, uh, your heart might be in the right place, but that's not what I want for you. I want to live in the city, that's not what I want for you. I want to live off grid, that's not what I want for you. That's what you want, that's not what I want for you. Well, I want to, you know, have this good job, uh, that's not what I want for you. The place that you're at, I know you don't like it, but I have you there for a reason. I know there's brethren that are praying for better jobs, and I'm still praying for you, brothers, brother in Christ that needed that, and other brethren that need the men that need good jobs, that maybe God has you where you are for a reason, but your heart's in the right place. I'm tired by the wickedness and the vexation. I want a job where I'm not vexed or anything. I understand that your heart's in the right place. But remember, the Lord directs your steps. He might have you there for a reason. Are you witnessing to, brother, to men there and women in these days? In these last days, are you witnessing? Are you being a, your life being a testimony and a light for the Lord and how you live? Are you leaving gospel tracts here and there? <laughs> you know, uh, you gotta live for the Lord wherever. Uh, Paul used to say, "Whatever I want to say the right word, boundary, whatever um, the words are eluding me, but state, whatever state that I am in, therewith be content." God has me here. Yes, it's hard. I, we're have, I'm, I might not be getting much food. My clothes are falling apart. Uh, cold nights. Whatever. But whatever state God has me in, therewith be content. Pray for better things, and I'm praying for you. But the point of this is the Lord directs your steps. The Lord through His Word will tell you what to do and what not to do. And in life, He'll say, well, I don't really want that for you. Not because it's necessarily a sin, but that's just not what I want for you. I need you over here. I need you doing this. I know you really want to do that, but I need you over here doing this. That's where I want you. The Lord directs his step. You know the NIV? It says, uh, in their hearts, man plans their course. You say, well, it's not the big thing, but here's the part that they always sneak in. Well, it kind of sounds the same. A man's heart deviseth his way, deviseth his way, and a, heart's, and a man's heart plans their course. That eh, kind of might be the same, but here's where they really foul up. But the Lord establishes their steps. Establishes? Is that what it says there? The Lord, is in, the, in the King James Bible, God's prayer, you know, it says the Lord directs your steps. You can still ignore the Lord. You can still fight the Lord and say, I want to live such and such way, even though that's not what God wants. And you can fight Him and fight Him and fight Him your whole life. It says the Lord directs your steps. Try and see if there was another verse here, but the Lord directs your steps. In other words, he points you in the right direction through his word and says, go that way. Do this. Don't do that. Like we said before, cling to that which is good. Abhor that which is evil. He will direct your steps. And there's times where you'll fail the Lord because you didn't go the direction God pointed. You did the wrong thing. How many of us can say that, brothers of Christ? We've failed the Lord big time. Since I've been saved, I've failed the Lord numerous times, big time. Why? Because I didn't go the direction God was going in, was pointing me in. I went the direction that my flesh wanted. Or the world was popular with the world. Or you might get a little prideful and puffed up. That's Satan's way. He is the, I got corrected on this. He is the king of pride. Brother says Christ, king of pride. 
but he's also the follower. Uh, uh, you have your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Talks about him being a liar from the beginning. When you start dealing with somebody who starts hating the truth, trying to correct the truth, trying to pervert the truth, you're dealing with someone who's a child of the devil. When you get to someone who's puffed up and so prideful and everything, you're dealing with someone who's of their father. I still say father of the devil, but the king of pride. They serve the king of pride, Satan. Can a brother in Christ start acting foolish like the lost world that serves Satan? Absolutely. Why? Because God will point you in the right direction and you'll start going your own direction. You'll try to do things your way instead of God's way. And when you fall flat on your face and it happens, are you going to let God pick you back up and point, put you back on the right path? Or are you going to keep fighting God, kicking and screaming like a little child? What's it going to be? But the Lord establishes their steps. No, He doesn't. He directs. Established means He makes it so. Like He's forcing you to do this. So then they can say, what I'm doing, it's not my fault. It's God's fault. Because it says, He establishes their steps. So what I did, if it's wrong, it's God's fault. No, it isn't. God will direct. He'll point. That's the way to go. But you get these brutish pastors out there, they'll give up on the Word of God and go for Bible versions. They'll try to justify sin and put all the blame on God. It's God's fault. It's not my fault. It's God's fault. Whereas a Bible believer who humbles himself, it's my fault, Lord. If I'm right, it's not because I'm right. It's because I line up with God's Word and God is right. And where I'm wrong and failing, it's not because God's at fault, it's because I'm 100% at fault. I'm not following this. I'm not talking about tough times. Tough times, hard times can happen, brothers and sisters of Christ. We might have to go through hard times. But I look back at my life as a Christian, and I look back at a lot of my hardest times that I went through. You want to know who the number one person who was at fault? This guy right here. It wasn't that I was going through hard, I know we might go through some hard persecution, some hard times of persecution, thrown in jail and stuff like that. But I'm saying until that time happens, my life, when I've gone through some very hard times, nightmares, just such pain and suffering, it's because this guy right here screwed up. I didn't follow the Lord's direction and the Lord's way. He directs my steps. I didn't listen to him. I thought I knew what was best, and I thought I knew better, and I went this other way, and I didn't go the way God said to go, or to do what God said to do. Stay away from these Bible perversions. If you still don't know, stay away from the Bible perversions, big time. Little words here and there will screw everything up, and that just destroyed everything when they said establish instead of direct. The King James Bible is the proper reading. Stick to the King James Bible. Back to Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 24. So what's going on here? Uh, 23 said, O Lord, I know that thy ways of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Lord, we're not supposed to be choosing our own path. And we're not supposed to be going against you. The Bible says, He that is not for me is against me. When you look at a pastor that starts out, he is for God. But when he becomes prudish, you're going to see he starts going against God. And if he's going against God, he's not for God. What's he for? Chances are, the world, the flesh, or Satan. Those three things come in, the three enemies, and mess a, a person up. There's a lot of men that get into the battle buildings and their heart's in the right place. Like we just, I want to go back to that first. Their heart is in the right place, brothers, says Christ. They want to serve God, and then they get destroyed by these so-called um, seminaries and Bible schools and they get destroyed. And they come out being brutish pastors. Pastors that are brutish. They come out, they go in and believe in the Word of God, they come out correcting it. Sometimes putting it down altogether. Jeremiah 10, 24, O Lord, O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger. We'll come back to this verse at the very end, but remember, O oh Lord, correct me. Correction is good. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for reproof, for correction, 
And I'm going through Proverbs right now, and so this verse, it talks about a wise man. A wise man loveth correction. Take it. A wise man loves rebuke, because it gets him back on the right path. A foolish man, and you know who you are out there, that don't take correction, that don't take rebuke, that believe they're above accountability, they're above correction, be very careful. Brothers and Christ, don't become like that. The Lord will correct you through His Word, through the Holy Spirit, through your conscience, your spirit, the conscience will bear witness with the Holy Spirit. But this book will point you in the right direction. All right? And it's a good thing. And if God uses a brother in Christ to correct you, brethren, to correct you, to get you back on the right path, you're not supposed to come back with an attitude of, Oh, I hate this. How dare you? How dare you speak against the man of God? And that's how some people have been treating men on, online and, and men in these battling. Don't you dare question the man of God. Look at this person. It's Jeremiah. Oh, Lord, correct me. Even when it feels like you're doing everything right, brother says Christ, you should always have that attitude and that heartfelt love for the Lord to please Him, to go, Lord, if there's anything wrong in my life, correct me. I might not see it right now. Like, sometimes we're ignorant. I, I talked about that idol I had in my house for the longest time, and I walked past it a million times, and then one time, God really put it on my heart to correct me and said, hey, you see that thing over there? It's an idol. It was a plate that I got from Japan. It had those two demon dogs that protect the home from evil spirits. I got it in my travels around the world. Okay. He corrected me. That should be our heartfelt desire. Lord, correct me. Get me on the right path. Keep me on the right path. I want to please you, Lord. Oh, Lord, correct me. But with judgment, not in thine anger. Now, why does he say this? Because he says here, lest thou bring me to nothing. Now he says this because now God doesn't make that mistake, but we make that mistake, brother says Christ. How many times have you tried to solve something out of anger and it made things worse? How many times that when it comes to children, there's some people that will tell you when they teach with children, the number one thing you do with your children is you never um, punish them out of anger. If you're frustrated or you're angry, you set them in time out and you walk away. And you walk it off. And you calm down and then you come back and you use judgment, good judgment, to correct that child. The same thing goes for the brothers and sisters in Christ. When you're going to correct a brother, I've failed this sometimes. Correct a brother, I get angry. I get frustrated. Okay, Especially with brethren who know better. I get angry. I get frustrated. you got to stop. Take a walk, talk with the Lord, and get that anger and frustration out and come back with this. Not your feelings and flesh, feelings and opinions, but come back with this, the Word of God. And he's saying, oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thy anger, lest I bring me to nothing. Because this is Old Testament. You can see God's judgment. When he, remember the Bible says, God can get angry. People don't believe that. Oh God, okay. God is slow to anger. But are you going to provoke him to jealousy? Are you going to try to anger him? The Jewish people did. You think the body of Christ today is in such a great position that God's just happy and it's and just so proud of the, the, the how do I say this, the condition of the body of Christ today? Oh no, he's not. Why? Because we're not all of the same mind and of the same judgment. We're not all striving together. You got men out there that are purposely causing division and then pointing the finger everywhere else and saying everybody else is causing the division, not me. You think he's not angry with the body of Christ today? The condition of the body of Christ as a whole? I believe he is. We're in the last days, brothers and sisters of Christ. But when God gets angry and gets jealous, read the Old Testament. Okay. When Jesus comes back, they always think the, the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. No, he is not. Jesus preached on hell a lot. He went into the uh, temple and threw the moneylenders out. He rebuked the leaders of his day. But he came to save men because there was a verse, I don't remember, 
where his disciples, I guess somebody didn't want, to, want him there for the Passover. I hope I'm using the right term of what they were doing. But they were going into a city. The city didn't receive him and treated him bad. And they asked the Lord, so we call and ask God to pour rain, fire down on that? He's like, I didn't come to destroy. You know why Jesus, when his earthly ministry, he wasn't about destroying. He came to save that which is lost. He came as a lamb, but when he comes back as a lying lion, he opens his mouth and wipes out the 200 million man army with his word, God's word through him. Opens his mouth, whoo, wipes him out. The thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, he's ruling with a rod of iron. O oh Lord, correct me, but with thy judgment. I'm supposed to do most of this at the end of the study, so we'll go over it again at the end of the study. But, yeah, it's very important. We want correction. You're supposed to love correction from the Lord through His Word, from brethren through His Word. Okay? You're not supposed to have a bad attitude when someone corrects you. And it's hard. When someone corrects you, it's just that fleshly defense comes up, a wall comes up. And it's like, uh, no, I'm tearing that wall down. Continue, brother. What was you, you were saying about me? Continue. Let's see what the scriptures say. Yes, you're right. I need to correct that. No, brother, you're, 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 you're not following the scriptures. I'm not wrong in this. i got to stand for what's right. But what's your attitude? 25. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen. And God will someday. That know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. What did we just see it right up there? For a pastor has become brutish, and has not sought the Lord. Some pastors can go from serving the Jesus Christ of Scripture to start falling for this Antichrist Jesus. There's pastors that once stood for the true plan of salvation. This is how I got saved. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Coming to God as a broken sinner, having sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against God, and realizing that those sins, part of that sorrow, is it's going to separate you from God and hell for all eternity. Your Creator. What can I do? I'm on my way to hell. There's nothing I can do to save myself. What can I do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's when you can actually turn to the cross and truly believe and hear faith and hear, not head knowledge, but believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is God fully and completely, He died for my sins. He paid the price I should have paid. Oh Lord, I am a wicked sinner. I do not deserve to go to heaven. I deserve to go to hell. But I believe in your Son. I believe in Jesus Christ. That it's God's blood that's shed on the cross to pay for my sins and can, and wash, my, and can wash my sins away. Lord, save me. And they go from that to worldliness where it's just, well, just belief, just head belief, death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah, that Jesus died for sins, but, you know, just sins of the world. Not necessarily my sins, but just sins of the world. Okay. You can have, and they start promoting a false Jesus Christ. They start pushing people away from the real Jesus Christ to a worldly Jesus Christ. They've become brutish. They're not seeking the real, capital L, Lord. Families that, that call not on thy name. This is talking about lost people, though. If we're trying to apply it for instruction and righteousness, it's lost people. But brother and sister in Christ, when's the last time you've called on Jesus' name and said, Lord, prayer. Lord, correct me. If there's something wrong, correct me. Lord, guide me. Lord, what do you think about this? Lord, what about that? Lord, open. The Bible talks about praying for wisdom. That God will open the scriptures. That you're to pray without ceasing. That you make your request known before God. Lord, I need help with this. Lord, I need help with that. Lately, I've been praying for the Lord to help me before things could fall apart in this country. Uh, help me get that wood stove. It's so important right now. I'm really struggling trying to uh, take care of that wood stove. Okay. But I trust the Lord. But I'm talking to the Lord about it. Just because Some people say you trust the Lord doesn't mean you don't talk to Him. I still talk to Him. I trust Him. Just because I talk to him, I trust him. There's times I talk to the Lord and he's like, are you trying to convince yourself? And I'm like, it does sound like that, doesn't it, Lord? But more importantly, I'm trying to remind myself that I trust you. 
that you've got everything under control. There's, this world keeps trying to take that trust from me, Lord. Take time to take that trust from me. I trust you, O oh Lord. When's the last time you've actually had serious prayer, brothers and sisters Christ? Have you gotten distracted by the world and the ways of the world and responsibilities and stuff like that? You get so distracted that you've... I haven't prayed in two days. I haven't read the Bible in a few days. Be careful. Make sure you're staying in prayer every day and you're reading the Word of God every day and you're hiding in your heart every day and doing your best to live it. For they have eaten up Jacob. You know what the world does today? Like I told you, those three enemies, the world, Satan, or the flesh, and Satan. Once you get saved, what do they try to do? They try to destroy you. They try to see that Satan tries to sift you like wheat, like he did Peter. He tries to mess you up. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him and consumed him and have made his habitation desolate. When I read that, I put it in the kind of my notes here. It's like, made his habitation desolate, the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble. The Jews are going to have a hard time in the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, Jeremiah 20, 10, 21. For the pastors have become brutish. The religious leaders, even back here in the Old Testament, and prophesying the time of Jacob's trouble. You got, you've got these Jewish leaders, pastors that are going to try to mislead them. This is this is your Messiah. This is your anti. This is Antichrist. Uh, he's an Antichrist, but he's the. I want to say the, but the Bible talks about many Antichrists. He's the ultimate persona of Antichrist, but he's the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast. Okay, and he, they're going to try to convince him this is the Messiah, and his ways are the right way, and they go against the word of God, and his ways go against the word of God. For the pastors have become brutish. Jeremiah ten twenty one. We're going back to it. For the pastors have become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Second Thessalonians chapter two verse three. Once again. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. That day is talking about the day of the Lord, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. Except there come a falling away first, and the man, and that man be revealed, the son of perdition. So you have the seven years of the time of Jacob's trouble, and those days will be shortened, and you have the catching away of the body of Christ. What's preventing the man of sin from being revealed? The body of Christ. He who will not let, will not let until he be taken out of the way. The body of Christ is hindering him. What's happening in the body of Christ before that, before we get caught up? The last thing that talks about, I believe, is the falling away. Brothers of Christ, that's why I push so hardcore. If it feels like I'm on you, please understand it's done with love. Because I'm on this guy, number one. And first of all, I pray a lot. You don't see my life here. If I had a house church, they'd see my life more than you do. I'm hitting this guy first and foremost to stand, stand, stand. Don't faint. Don't falter. To the very end, we're running a race as if one receiveth the prize. Okay, the falling away first. In these last days, we're going to see more and more brethren fall away. And I'm doing my best to, to be a servant of the Lord and to see, I'm like, Lord, what can I do? And Sometimes it's like, I said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Is there a way we can slow it down? Uh, house churches? Get back to doing house churches. Back to physically meeting together where you can see how everybody lives. There is no high and mighty, I'm above accountability like you can be online. I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but the one thing about online, I love doing Bible studies online. I love being able to watch Bible studies online, Brother Says Christ. It's a way for me to be a service to the Lord and to help you and be a, ser and be a servant to you, brothers and sisters of Christ. But the one thing I hate more than anything about the internet is you got all the sin and wickedness, but God got, gets that out of your life. But what I hate most about the internet is there's zero accountability, actual zero accountability on the internet for Bible believers. There's zero accountability. And that's starting to become popular it's become, it's, it's pleasing to the brethren. That's why they love online ministries versus having an actual house church there. Because with an actual house church there, you actually get to see how everybody's living. 
Not just their talk online, but their walk in real life. And they're getting so comfortable with the online that there's no accountability, and I love it. And it's dangerous, brothers and sisters. And that's hurting the body of Christ big time. We need to get back to true accountability. We need to get back to being able to encourage brethren face to face and be there to physically help one another. The Bible word is exhort to keep standing, to keep looking for Jesus Christ. Do you need help with that, brother? I'll help you with that, brother. To be there one for another. And actually get to see there's no hiding behind a camera. What's really going on in the life of that person behind the camera? Start with this guy right here. We need house churches. We need true accountability. The falling away is becoming great. And we have pastors, men of God, preachers and teachers that are becoming brutish. They're starting to become part of the falling away. People we didn't even think it would ever happen to. So let's start with the first part there. For pastors to become brutish. What's the best verse that I found talking about what the definition of, of what a pastor, uh, brutish means. Become brutish. Uh, Psalms 92.1. Turn to Psalms 92.1. Psalms 92.1. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Remember that. To give thanks unto the Lord. And to sing praise unto thy name, O Most High. To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning, and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings, and upon the psaltery. I don't even know why I have that. Sorry, Lord. Upon an instrument of ten strings, and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with the solemn sound. For the Lord has made me glad through thy works. I will triumph, triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Thy thoughts, doing the work of the Lord. Here it is, verse 6. A brutish man knoweth not. Neither doth a fool understand this. Notice how the Bible likens a brutish man to a fool. Not likens him, but puts him in the same boat, let's say. A brutish man is put in the same boat as a fool. You know what the fool is? A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And it likens a brutish man to a fool. The brutish man, we read there, he's, the next part of this is he stops seeking the Lord. He starts, at, you know, you can be as God's knowing good and evil. Hmm. But notice we're going to reread that, because now that we got to the end there, it says, For a brutish man knoweth not, and a fool, and, and neither doth a fool understand this. All right. It says there, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Let's stop there real quick. A brutish man is one that gets very prideful, and he forgets who it is that saved him. Who is truly in control of everything? Who it is he's supposed to please? Remember, for thy pleasure they are and were created. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Okay, look at the Jewish leaders coming out of Egypt. It's a good example. The Jewish leaders coming out of Egypt. They saw everything that God did for them. God saved them. All the miracles. And they get out of Egypt... And how they forgot all the Lord had done for them, almost like that. Anytime some hardship came along, they forgot. They started whining and muttering behind Moses' back. Oh, where would we stay? We should have just stayed in Egypt. Oh, we should have died in Egypt and everything. They start going to the way of the world. Egypt's the type of the world. They start wishing that they'd stayed in the world. If you get a pastor who becomes brutish, he starts getting into the world. It becomes about me, myself, and I. How many times we've come across pastors that we love and care about, and you start noticing that they start giving, they start taking glory for themselves too much. 
And they're not giving it to God. They want the praise of men more. They're not giving God thanks and telling those men give God thanks. There's, there's some men that will come onto my chan uh, channel in the comment section and they'll try to give me glory. And I'm not, being, I'm not saying that they're bad people, they're brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ. I always tell you, give God the glory. I try and put in there, to God be the glory. And I'm just a servant of the Lord, to God be the glory. I thank God that He's, he's using me. You give God the glory. But what does a brutish man do? He starts taking all the glory for himself. I did this, and I did that. And I sacrificed my day to be with you. So bow down and kiss my ring. You know, it's like, what happens? A lot of these preachers in these battle buildings, they don't give God the glory with the life that they're living and with their words. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praise unto thy name, O Most High. Brothers and sisters in Christ, be very careful. Be very, very careful. Upon instruments, praising the Lord. They stop praising the Lord and they want praise of men. You know the three, I thought there was just one, but do you know the three definitions of a, because um, I got called a Pharisee recently by a brother in Christ whom I love and care about, I got called a Pharisee by him. And I started looking into Pharisees, and we'll probably get this into, an, into another a Bible study in this, but I got into a Pharisee and realized there was actually three descriptions of a Pharisee. Do you know what those three descriptions are? The one that we mostly we know of is that he holds the commandments of men above the word of... Uh, I mean, sorry, he, he holds the traditions of men above the commandments of God. Traditions of men, rudiments of the world above this. But what we often forget about is, you know the big motivator for holding the traditions of men above the commandments of God? Money. They did it for a profit. When Jesus calls them out that that might be profited, you've made God's word of none effect by your traditions because it was profitable. It's because it's the flesh. They want to do things their way. They don't want to do things God's way. And it's profitable. So one of the definitions of a uh, Pharisee is they hold the traditions of men above the commandments of God. They become about profit. Men in ministry become brutish. It becomes a paycheck. It's no longer a life calling. It becomes a paycheck. It becomes about money. And the third thing was is they love the praise of men. Pharisees love the praise of men. They love to be the ego stroked, the pride stroked. They love men praising them and giving them all the glory. Be very careful. I looked into that. I said, Lord, am I doing that? I had a brother in Christ call me that. Am I be actually being a Pharisee? Am I holding the, command, the traditions of men and rudiments of the world above the commandments of God? If I am, Lord, help me get it out. Lord, um... If I'm, am I about money? Am I money-oriented when it comes to serving you? Am I having a, a hidden agenda? Am I doing it only to get something out of it? Or am I doing it because it's my life? It's, I belong to you and, and my heart's desire is to serve you and please you. No matter what the cost. And Lord, am I doing this to be popular? To be famous? To get the praise of men? Or am I doing this to get your praise, O oh Lord. To come, so I can see you someday and you look at me and go, Well done, thou good and faithful one. To be uh, bold in the day of judgment, Paul talks about. I want to be bold. I'm going to still hit my face to the ground. And Lord, in front of Jesus Christ, my face to the ground, just like John did, the disciple whom Jesus loved, fell as if he were dead before the feet. Okay. But are we going to be able to stand bold on the day of judgment? Am I doing this for you, Lord, to serve you? Or am I doing this for myself? Something I had to ask myself and, really, and see if I was doing it. And that brother in Christ that claimed that I'm the Pharisee, he would do well to do the same thing. To check himself. Big time. So when you've got a Brutus pastor that forgets who saved him, 
with his actions, his life, he gets distracted by the world, gets distracted by his flesh, gets distracted by Satan, and he stops looking for Jesus Christ. What happens? The, for, a past, for the pastor has not sought the Lord. Okay. Turn to Joshua 9. We're going to look at some examples of what happened when somebody did not seek the Lord. What happened? Remember, the Lord directs your steps, but if you're not seeking the Lord to ask the Lord, what steps should I take? Joshua 9. Wrong direction. Okay, I'm lost. <laughs> I can't believe I got all backwards. Um, there's Joshua. Small book. Like I said, small writing. I'm used to my big book now because it's got large writing and it takes three or four pages to get some chapters go two or three pages. Um, Joshua 9, 1. There it is. And it came to pass. Joshua 9, 1. And it came to pass. When all the kings which were at, on, the side, on this side Jordan, and the hills, and the valleys, and all the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Pizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done in Jericho to Ai. Remember when Joshua would ask the Lord, what should we do? How should we do this? When he went to go fight Jericho, that's the biggest battle with Joshua. Jericho, Jericho, the battle of Jericho. God told him to do this. They went around the city seven times, playing and singing and praising God. And the seventh time, the walls fell, they went in. But he sought the Lord, the guidance from the Lord. But first of all, they did work willingly and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sack on their asses and wine bottles, old and rent, and bound up. And old shoes and clouded upon their feet, and old garments upon them, and on the bread of their of their provisions was dry and moldy. They they got set up to deceive them. And they went to Joshua unto the camp of Gilgad, and said unto him and unto the men of Israel, We be come from a far country. Now therefore make ye a league with us. You know that's happening today. You have people that put on a put good show. I got a nice suit and tie. I'm in a Babel building, or behind a camera even, and I look good, but they're trying to deceive you. You need to look through the Lord, and you need to search the Scriptures. Or what they're saying lines up with the Scriptures, or are they going against the Scriptures? That's what matters. You seek the Lord for guidance. You don't go off their appearance. Okay? That's why the Bible says, um, judge not on the outward appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Once again, I had a brother in Christ recently trying to get brethren to judge me on the outward appearance and not judge righteous judgment. You ask God, God open the scriptures to me, is this man true or is this man fake? Is he false? Verse 7, And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? So they had a thought that maybe this isn't right. What if you draw one? So what should they have done after this? When they had this question nagging at them, wait a minute, something's not right here, what should they have done? They should have sought the Lord. Did they seek the Lord? Let's keep reading. And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. Good words and fair speeches. We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, We are ye, who are ye, and from whence come ye? Now stop there for a second. Did Joshua say, wait a second, Lord, what do I do with this? What is your will? We need your guidance, Lord. We need your counsel. What do we do with this? No, he proceeded to ask them. Okay. And a way you can look at this is the type of the world. The world's always trying to pull you and deceive you, these people. And they said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come because of thy name of the Lord thy God. Never talk about calling on the name of the Lord. There are some people that will verbally call upon the name of the Lord, but you still need to say, Lord, is this person real? 
help open the scriptures, let me listen to what they're saying, let me see how they're living, the fruits, be very careful. Look what they said. Because of the, of, the, of the name of the Lord thy God. That's why we've come. Because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt. And all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan. To Siphon, king of Hishbon. And to o Og, Og <laughs> king of Basham, which was at Astaroth. Ashtaroth. Wherefore our elders and all our inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for, your, for the journey, and to meet them that say unto them, We are your servants. Therefore now make ye a league with us. You know, kind of like, hey, I'm in a nice suit and tie. You know why door-to-door -door salesmen, back in the day, door-to-door -door salesmen, they would wear suit and tie? Because it makes them look like honest men, good men. Why do you think lawyers wear, <laughs> wear suits and ties? And then it makes you wonder, why in the battle building are people wearing suits and ties? Now, I'm not against it. I love Peter Ruckman. I, got, I still have his videos. I'm still trying to do a, a log of all the videos I've got of his. Uh, I love him to death, but why wear a suit and tie? You don't have to. If you want to, eh. But you don't have to, but why is the world as a whole, all these professions that's all about deception and deceiving and unhonest, why do they put on a suit and tie? Look, I'm wearing a suit and tie. Look, we have a Babel building. Look how grand our temple made with hands is. Look behind me. There's, you know, look at this bookshelf behind me. Now I had, but before you say I'm trying to attack a brother in Christ, please understand, I've had videos if you look at some of my old videos, I had it set up before where the bookshelves were, in, were behind me. I'm not against having bookshelves behind you. But brothers and sisters in Christ, there are some men that have like Dr. So-and-so, Ph.D. and this and that. And, look, and they're all about wisdom and everything. Okay, There's nothing wrong with having bookshelves behind you. But, blah, blah, but if they keep saying, because of these bookshelves, that's what makes me wise. You need to be careful. You need to seek the Lord. Is what they're saying lines up with the scriptures? Are they pointing you to the Word of God as the solution to all your problems? But you got these people here that they're putting on a show, they're putting on a really good show, and the name of the Lord thy God. This our bread we took hot for our provisions out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you, but now behold, it is dry and it is moldy. Especially these uh, television evangelists put on a huge show like that. They'll go that far to put on a show. And these bottles of wine which we filled were new, and behold, they be rent. And these are garments, and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. And the men took up their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live and the princes of, con of the congregation swear unto them. And it came to pass at the end of three days after they had made a league with them that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they dwelt among them. They did not seek counsel of the Lord. Brothers and sisters of Christ, for today, you need to be seeking counsel of the Lord. When a brother in Christ, when you get into ministry, you need to be seeking the counsel of the Lord all the time. And the biggest pull it's going to pull you is to start seeking counsel of the world. To let your flesh run you. Okay? I always try to say it, and then Satan. I always try to say it like this, brother says Christ. When you're lost, that three, those three enemies aren't messing with you that, at all. Because they're in charge to begin with. Eh, they're not messing with you. Fighting you, in other words. But you get saved, those three enemies, they start fighting you hardcore. If you're a young man that wants to be in ministry and you start trying to get into ministry, or you are in ministry, a man in ministry, those three things are going to hit you even harder. you are become like the number one target, number one enemy. You're promoting leading people to Christ. You're promoting the, the brethren, the flock, the sheep, to lead people to Christ, to hide this word in your heart. To live for Jesus Christ, 
cling to that which is good, abhor that which is evil. They don't like that. So they're trying to, you're become a target, a big target. The Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against pow ru powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is a war going on. It's a spiritual war. You go to get into ministry, they're going to start attacking you. And they want you to become brutish. They want to destroy you. They want to make you useless when it comes to serving God. All right. Turn to 2 Kings 1.1. 1, 1. As you turn to 2 Kings 1.1, 1, 1, um, there's a lot of times in the Bible where people weren't seeking. Um, they weren't seeking God, the counsel of the Lord. And they screwed up a lot. And when they sought the counsel of the Lord, it's still three, there's still three types. There's those who don't seek the counsel of the Lord. There's those who seek the counsel of the Lord and obey it. And then you have those who seek the counsel of the Lord, but still choose to do the worldly thing. They don't obey it. Those are your three types of people. Which one are you? Which one are you? Second Kings. Not first Kings. Second Kings. One one. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab, and Ananias fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Let that sink in, brothers, says Christ. This, if I was trying to apply this for instruction righteousness today, it's, just, it's, like a, it's like me, when I tell you, brothers, Christ, if you come to me with a prayer request, I will pray for you. But you want to know the first thing that I usually try to tell people? I ask them, did you take it to the Lord yourself first? But imagine you have a man up there, he's a man of God, and instead of going to the Lord and his word for help and going to the Lord for help, he goes to the world. He always goes to the world. It's not about what God says or what God thinks. It's, hey, what do you think, guys? Imagine someone who's saved going over to a, let's say, a, a, a pastor that's brutish. I'll do a better scenario. <laughs> I'm trying to get this in my head, brothers. Right. You have a pastor in a so-called church Bible building, and he walks across the street, and there's a satanic cult going on building over there, and he goes over to the satanic cult and asks him, what do you think about this? Should I do this, or should I do that? Imagine that. Now imagine that same scenario where you have a pastor up there that does away with the King James Bible and goes for the Bible perversions, the Antichrist spirit Bibles. Going back to Catholicism. And he's more worried about pleasing the men that he asks the people what they think. How is that any different? You're supposed to preach what God says and you take in what brethren do when it comes to correction, being accountable, being encouraged, exhorting one another. But the first person you're supposed to seek is Jesus Christ. What do we have? This king of Israel, he sent someone straight to a pagan god. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Elijah, the Tishpite, Arise, go up and meet the messenger of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, It is not because there is no god in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Are you insane? Have you fallen that far? That's why I feel sometimes when I ask some of the, these, as you try to deal with some of these online preachers, um, and if you deal with these, I've come across preachers uh, in town that preach in Babel buildings. I bought a vehicle from one once. And it's like, they're not seeking God, they're seeking the world. Who's the lowercase g God of this world? If they're not seeking capital G God, Jesus Christ, through His Word, and they're seeking the world, who's the lowercase g God of this world? Satan. 
If you want to be a man in ministry, you've got to remember that this is the foundation in all matters of faith and practice. And there's some brethren out there that I love have forgotten that. They keep trying to push the world now. Take your eyes off Jesus Christ and put it on the world. Verse 4. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord. He's going to give them, Lord. I know you didn't go to the Lord for, for what to do, but now I'm telling you what the Lord's wanting me to tell you. The Lord's telling them. Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed, and when the messenger turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are ye now turned back? And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. No, 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 it's thus saith my preferences. No, it's thus saith the Lord. No, 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 it thus saith the world. Thus saith the Lord. No, but my flesh is telling me and my feelings and opinions, which we did. And then Satan, lowercase g, God of the world. No, it's thus saith the Lord. Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shall surely die. When you get a preacher that's become brutish and starts going the way of the world, one of the worst things they can do is turn their back on the King James Bible and the gospel that's found therein. And what do they do? They start, leading, they start creating false converts and leading people to hell. It's a serious thing, brothers in Christ. You want to get in ministry? You want to serve the Lord in full-time? Like I said, I'm not full-time ministry. I've never claimed to be full-time ministry. This is me doing what I can to serve the Lord until God calls me home, either in death or the catching away of the body of Christ, or He calls me to do a house church or be part of a house church. Okay? But I'm not full-time ministry. But brothers, even if you do part-time ministry like I'm doing, this still applies in the sense of your attitude and where your heart should be. You should always seek the Lord, and you should get that in a habit to always seek the Lord. The Lord has blessed me lately that when I'm doing things, I, when I pray, I said, if it be your will, Lord, I need to go to town today to get some stuff. Something as simple as, i got to go to town to get some things. If it be your will, Lord, please let me go to town and get some things. I start doing a project around here. Lord, if it be your will, can I get this to help me to get this done, Lord? If it be your will, thus saith the Lord... You don't have to turn here, but Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Seek him. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. For today it's after salvation. That will happen guaranteed after salvation. God will change your life. You'll fight him. I fought him. Sometimes you will fall back into the old man. I've done that. But if you're truly saved, you've sought the Lord with all your heart, you're going to find Him. He's going to lead you to the true plan of salvation. He's going to lead you to the King James Bible as God's perfect written word. And He's going to start doing a work in you. Okay. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. If you've fallen away, brother, if you're in ministry and you realize that this is really... a convicting your heart and hammering you that you've kind of fallen away and you kind of made a mess of things. And let him return to the Lord, unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Brother in Christ out there, brethren out there that have fallen away, God can pick you back up. I always try to warn the brethren, there's two types of people that will do correcting. There's the type of people that when they correct you, brethren, that when they correct you, it's to build you back up. You've fallen down flat on your face, and God's got to break you again to put you back together to build you back up. And our goal when we preach rebuke or correction is to see you built back up and get to that standing position. I want my brethren back that I've lost fellowship with because I've corrected them, and they prefer their fallen state than, than being corrected and standing back up. I want my fellowship back with them. But they've got to repent. They've got to drop the pride and the ego. And they've got to get back to be their first love, which is the Scriptures. 
That's one way that you correct. Then you have the lost world, snakes, wolves in sheep's clothing, that they're just pointing out your flaws and pointing out what you did wrong, and they're not doing it to cor necessarily correct you. They're doing it to destroy you. You're already down flat on your face, but they're trying to destroy you so you never get back up. Those are your two types of people you're dealing with. Brothers, I'm this one. I want to pick. There's times I've fallen flat on my face and God had to break me, my pride, and my trying to do things my way and get me built back up. Sometimes God's done it through brethren correcting me to build me back up. Brother says Christ, but brethren that are in ministry, when I correct you and say, hey, I believe you're wrong with this, or I'm showing you the scriptures where you're not right here, it's not because I hate you. And I'm not doing it to destroy you or your, your ministry, your ability to be in God's ministry. I'm doing it to build you back up. And so there's times where you can get too zealous. I've gotten zealous before, and I jumped the gun, and then God showed me later I was the one that was wrong. It's happened. It has happened. But my heart was in the right place. I'm not trying to destroy a brother in Christ. I'm trying to let God, let you, get you to let God build you back up. Through His Word. Through correction. Titus 2.13 reads, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of a great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have the commandments of God or the commandments of men. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope, and that's my goal. If you're looking for that blessed hope, then you love correction. Because if God could come back today, am I doing something wrong? God could come back any day. He can come back before I finish this video. Do you love correction? Do you love rebuke? When it's done in a loving way and it's done stern, you can be stern and still do it in a loving way. When you correct your child, you don't correct your child by laughing and putting on a shell like a clown. You're stern and you're straightforward, but you do it out of love. You make him know that this is serious. What you did was wrong. It is serious. You do it out of love. But make sure it's also based off the scriptures. But looking for that blessed hope. It, does that promote, like, the imminent return of Jesus Christ, once again, does that promote people to love correction and rebuke? Yes. When someone says, oh, I don't believe in the imminent return anymore, he starts becoming a preacher that we're talking about. What is it? Uh, a brutish, uh, brutish, say, for the pastors have become brutish, and they stop seeking the Lord. When they stop seeking that Lord, the coming of Jesus Christ, what are they looking at? They're looking at the world. They start becoming, they become brutish. They stop looking for Jesus Christ. They become brutish. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Real quick, 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord and the righteous judge shall give me on that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. We talked about this before. I just want to throw those in there. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day now, you're seeking the Lord. That's another way of seeking the Lord. You're looking for his coming with the life that you're living. Lord, what do I need to do? What, what would you have me do? Lord, what do I need to stop doing? Lord, what have I accidentally let back into my life? Sometimes I say accidentally trying to be nice, but when you actually look into it, when you've left bad things back into your life, it wasn't really an accident. You let it in. Lord, what have I let back in my life that needs to go back out? Where am I failing you? Lord, where, where am I doing right by you? And continue in that. Okay? That push is there when you believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. When you start acting like post and mid trib and you turn your back on the imminent re return of Jesus Christ, they're not seeking the Lord. They're all about the world and worldliness and fleshliness. Right? Acts 17.24 Acts 17.24 Acts 17, 24. God that made the whole, I'm sorry, God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelt not in temples made with hands. 
<laughs> we're talking about the battle buildings. Not in temples made with hands. Some people are doing things that they'll buy a building and try to act like they'll use other titles for it, but I pray that they don't treat it like a Babel building. So, okay. But not temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord. We're, what's hard in these last days is people think they have the Lord. They have this fake, fake Jesus and trying to reach someone who's saved. I mean, you walk up to a woman. Uh, I was uh, in Medford a couple days ago getting my car worked on the truck. And a woman walked by, bald head except for just a little bit of hair that was like red. And men's apparel just looks like a man walking by. And my first thought is, is it used to be like, Ew. now my first thought is, she's Jesus Christ. You walk up to her and you try to witness to her. And I get, I get you 90% of the time what, what I get from people like that. Now, I missed the opportunity with her. But I was talking with the brother in Christ, one of my, my uncle. And I was like, 90% of the time, if I got the opportunity to talk to her, to hand her a gospel tract, what I get around here is that, oh, I'm a Christian. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. They've been deceived into believing that they can be saved and have the world. I mean, I talk to people around here all the time. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. That they should seek the Lord. If you, What we're looking for is brethren, uh, the, we're looking for men out there, not brethren, but men out there and women out there that are broken. They're seeking something. They're seeking the Lord. They don't know that they're seeking the Lord, but they're seeking something. There's something wrong with them. There's something wrong with this world. They're seeking the Lord. They just don't know it. But they're humble. God has broken them. The ones who think they've already found the Lord, they're the hardest ones to deal with. And we try to show them, uh, the Lord, the Jesus that you worship, has no basis in Scripture. And they're so hard to deal with. It says here for the whole world that they should seek the Lord, if happily he might find, and if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. The Holy Spirit's out there convicting the world, trying to bring people to Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit in us is we're supposed using us to convict brethren, or brethren, uh, to convict brethren, but to convict the world for salvation. You're supposed to live a life of Christ. We're supposed to be holier than thou. We're supposed to be living a right life, a changed life, be new creatures of Christ Jesus. Because the life that we live is supposed to convict the world. I have neighbors that came up. Oh, you want to come? Over? I'm sorry, I can't. I don't. I, I can't be around drinking. I can't be around that satanic style music. Sorry, I, I don't like being around cussing. I'm sorry, I just... I, that sin there, that sin there, I'm sorry. You know, the, We're going to watch a movie, sorry. That movie promotes fornication, uh, feminism, sodomy. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't have anything to do with it. False gods, it mocks God. I can't have anything to do with it. What are you, holier than thou? Amen. We're supposed to be brothers and sisters of Christ. We're not supposed to look like the world and act like the world. We're supposed to be set apart to the point where our lives convict them and say, hey, why am I not living like that Christian, that saint, that brother or sister in Christ? It's supposed to convict them. And this whole false movement of easy believism where you can just believe in your head and you're saved and you can go on looking like the world and acting like the world, they've fallen for an antichrist. That antichrist spirit. That's why Paul talks about in uh, Corinthians, first second Corinthians about if anybody preach another gospel which we have not preached, or another Jesus which we have not preached, or receive another spirit, an antichrist spirit that we haven't that's not in us. Okay? That's what's going on. That they should seek the Lord. It's hard to reach people for Jesus Christ today. But that doesn't mean we need to stop trying. We need to keep trying, brothers. There's some brother out there that's kind of motivated and have the attitude of we should stop trying without saying we should stop trying. But that's what they really are. Have their attitude of, Ugh, 
And it's like, we need to keep trying, brother, says Christ. Until the day we die, or God calls us home, we need to keep trying, no matter how wicked this world gets, to try to get them to seek the Lord. The ministry of reconciliation. Verse 28, For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our... If your own poets have said, for we, are also, for we are also his offspring. All life was created by Jesus Christ. And in him, we have our life. I'm only alive today. If I was lost, I'd still only be alive today because of Jesus Christ. Physically. Spiritually, I'm dead. I'm on my way to hell if I was lost. When I get saved, you're quickened by the Spirit. Okay. My soul is now connected to Jesus Christ. But physically, our physical bodies, God's the one keeping everybody alive. He's the lifeline. We're supposed to seek the Lord. When we sought the Lord at salvation, brothers and sisters of Christ, we're to continue seeking the Lord. We don't stop. Isaiah 29, 15, another thing that I've noticed when it comes to seeking the Lord, when a pastor becomes brutish, he not only doesn't seek the Lord, the counsel of the Lord, some of those men, those wolves in sheep's clothing that are pastors that are brutish, that are fake and false, they hide from the counsel of the Lord. Isaiah 29, turn all the way back to Isaiah. Isaiah 29, 15. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. It goes back to what I was talking about online. The reason a lot of you have... I, I, there's brothers and sisters in Christ online. I love you, my brothers and sisters Christ. But there's a lot of people online that are trying to sneak in and, pre, and play Christian. The online Christian. You know, you have the Sunday Christian that's only a Christian when they put on their nice suit and tie and go to the Babel buildings. You have online Christians. They're only Christians online. Okay? Whose works are in the dark. But they wouldn't dare be part of a house church or a meeting house. Because then people would actually see them and how they live their lives. They like their works being in the dark. And they say, who seeth us? And who knoweth us? Who seeth us and who knoweth us? God does. There's nothing that's hidden that will not be brought to light. Either at the judgment seat of Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, or for the lost people out there at the great white throne. There's nothing that won't be brought to light. You think that if you're doing it, you're hiding it and God's not seeing it, you're going to have to answer for it, brothers and sisters in Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ. Men in ministry, you're really going to have to answer for it. God holds you to a higher standard. Why? Because people look to you. Paul says, be followers of me as I am of Christ. Paul would say, follow our example. Our example? There was other men with him. Barnabas, before he fell away. Um, you have Timothy. Titus. Um, some of the other men that were with him. Luke. As you have us for an example, when you get up and become a pastor, a preacher to you, someone who's more of a leadership position, you're going to have people that are going to follow you. And God's going to hold you to a higher standard because if you start misleading them and start leading them into the world, like some of the brethren I know of, and you too, brother Jesus Christ, start leading them into the ways of the world, God's going to hold you accountable more than He is those people that follow you into the world. Eventually, everybody's going to have to answer for themselves. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters Christ, you'll come across mostly wolves in sheep's clothing, but there are brethren that I believe want to get in ministry, but there's still things that they're hiding. Think that they're hiding from the brethren, and they're hiding from the Lord. And they're hiding from His counsel. They're not seeking His counsel. There's times I fought the Lord where I found, I, I saw, like I said, I was... When I was lost, I wasn't seeking the counsel of the Lord. Remember I told you about those three types of people. I was not seeking the counsel of the Lord when I was lost. When I got saved, newly saved, I sought the counsel of the Lord, but I decided to do my own thing. 
God chastised me. God had to smack me around a lot until he could get me over to being that person that when I sought the counsel of the Lord, I do seek him all the time, that I listen to him and obey his counsel, heed his counsel. When you got men like this that we just read there, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? That reminds me of Romans 12, 2, where it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You'll get people behind the camera, in the battle buildings, it says they don't have to prove anything. Why? Because if they did, they'd prove that they're conforming to the world, and they're trying to hide it. They try to push this, oh, we're not supposed to judge. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Prove your own selves. The Bible talks about You can be a reprobate. Prove your own selves. Are you truly saved and born again? Where is the changed life? Where is that love of God's word and living it? And looking for our Savior every day with the life that you're living? Through God's word. Okay. Another verse is uh, 1 John 2.15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. These hirelings and these wolves in sheep's clothing don't you want you to realize that there is no love of God in them. They love the world. But they're hiding from the counsel of the Lord and they're trying to hide uh, their works in darkness. Who are you to judge me? James 4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enemy of God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I can keep going, spoiled, spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit. After the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. If it's not after Christ, what is it after? The world, the flesh, Satan. So you have pastors... Don't ever become brutish, brothers and sisters in Christ. A brother, I'm sorry, brothers. I'm used to saying brothers and sisters in Christ. Brethren out there. Brethren can become pastors. Okay? Um, and like I said, sisters in Christ, when it comes to the elder women teaching the younger women, don't become brutish in it. But when it comes to being a pastor and preaching the Word of God, that's for men. Okay? Men, don't become brutish. Why? Because you'll start getting prideful. You'll start getting puffed up. You'll stop giving God all the glory. You'll start forgetting who it is that saved you. And then that same period, you'll stop seeking the Lord. You'll start doing things your way. And then you start consulting yourself or men and say, I'm going to do it this way because I feel this is the right. I, I want to do it this way. And I'm just going to do it this way. And you don't go, Lord, this is how I'd like to do it. But Lord, what does your word say? Or Lord, can you give me some advice? Can you help me do this the right way? And so oh, you might come along a video that teaches you how to build it the right way or do something the right way. Or a brother in Christ might come up and say, hey, I've done that before. I can show you the right way to praise the Lord. But you stop seeking the Lord. And then after a while, you start hiding, hiding. Okay. Hide their counsel from the Lord. They hide it. They don't. They, their counsel... It's not about the Lord anymore. All right? Be very, very, very careful, brothers and sisters of Christ. Be very, very careful. We're not done yet. I still got, got a good ways to go. Party wants to end this here and do part two. And that's probably what I'll do. We'll get into part two. Uh, just split it right here. But we're going to keep going. The next part, okay, brutish. You become brutish. You forget who it is that saved you, why you got saved, and who it is you serve. You get very prideful. You want the praise of men, and you take all the glory for yourself. And it leads you to not seeking the Lord and His guidance, and you start doing things the world's way, or the flesh's way, or Satan's way. And what does that lead to? For the pastors shall not prosper. Because of that, the pastors shall not prosper. Okay? 